Right, we're looking today at the, the last church that Jesus wrote to. We looked at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Cyrus, Philadelphia, and now we come to Laodicea. So let's pray, and uh, we'll begin in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, after we pray. Lord, thank you for just bringing us all together this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather around your word. And we pray, Lord, as your word goes forth, that it will enter our hearts, that, Lord, faith would be the result. We thank you, Lord, for preserving your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to be gathered in a nation where we experience the freedoms we do. And we just ask you, Lord, to protect, to preserve our nation and the freedoms. And, Lord, that the freedom we know can be exported all over the world. We know that probably won't happen until you set up your kingdom, but we look forward to that anyway. We pray to that end. We desire that, Lord, and we express that to you now. Lord, as we read your word, please speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Hebrews 3, the first part of verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? So, this is who we're talking to. We're talking about uh, Laodicea. As with the other six churches, we find that this church can be looked at as representative of a particular period of church history. We'll talk more about that later, but this time period began around 1900, generally, if you want to look at it as a, a period of church history. Um, but Laodicea, back in the day when John was writing and Jesus was speaking, um, it was an important wealthy city with a significant Jewish population. Like the other cities in the region, it was a center for Caesar worship and the worship of the healing god, oh boy, Asclepios, I think is how you say it. You don't know if it's right or wrong, do you? So I can say it any way I want to, right? So we'll just call it that. Uh, there was a famous temple of Asclepios in Laodicea with a more famous medical school connected with the temple. So a little bit about Laodicea. It goes on and says it was also a noted commercial center and some of its goods were exported all over the world, or the known world anyway. It is frequently noted that Laodicea prided itself on three things. Financial wealth, an extensive textile industry, and a popular eye salve sab that was exported around the world. Now Jesus uses those three things in verse 18 to contrast their supposed strength with the real need that only he can provide. So we'll look at that a little more, but... <clears throat> they were known for those three things. That was the thing they prided themselves in. Financial wealth, uh, extensive textile industry, and the eye salve that they made, that they produced. One of their problems, they had a poor water supply. Uh, it made them vulnerable to attack. That's an important thing. You know, back then, what they would do when an army would attack is they'd just surround your city. They build the siege mounds and they just, no supplies come in, no supplies go out. So water is important, you know. <laughs> you can't last very long without water. So it made them very susceptible. Um, let me see. I shouldn't have spoke off the top, then I lose my point. The main water <laughs> supply, that's what I wanted, came on a six-mile aqueduct from the hot springs of Heriopolis. Because the water came from hot springs, can you imagine, it arrived unappetizingly lukewarm. There's nothing worse than lukewarm water, is there? <laughs> so in his letter, Jesus makes reference to lukewarmness to help his church understand how their character is not right before him. So lukewarm, that's the problem. This is the lukewarm church. That's its title. Uh, with Ephesus, they were the loveless church. I don't want to be one of them. And Smyrna was a persecuted church. I don't know if I want to be that or not. The reality is, <clears throat> under persecution, the church typically grows. So maybe persecution isn't a bad thing. 
But I'm a wimp, so I don't really want persecution. <laughs> it's just the way it is, you know. I'm soft, and I don't mind saying so. Uh, Pergamos was a compromising <coughs> church. And that's never good. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Black is black, white is white. That's the way it needs to be. No compromise. Thyatira, a corrupt church. God help us. There's so many of those in the, in the world today, churches who are corrupt. May it never be said of this place. Then you have Sardis, which is the dead church. Look like they're doing stuff, but they're not doing anything at all. And last week we talked about Philadelphia, the faithful church. Well, of course that's what we want to be. Of course that's who we are. We are that, but we want to be that. You know, and as we talked about that last week, you know, as I said, because each one of these attributes, you can also see within a church in individual members. We could be in a church, it's a faithful church, but be someone who is compromising or corrupt or persecuted or loveless or any one of those attributes. So they can also be attributes of individuals. They can be of a particular church, known for being corrupt, known for being compromising, or known for being faithful. And as I said, also a time, a church age, it can be that as well. And many have looked at that, how if you look back at church history, you can see how the early church, they are so busy doing the work of the Lord, they forgot the Lord. And so they were loveless, they had left their first love. And and then you get into the persecuted church as uh, that period of time, about 300, the year 300 and so on, where Rome was heavily, or up until that time, where Rome was heavily persecuting the church. In the, in the, the 300s, that's when um, Constantine, he kind of got together with, got saved, it seems, but decided that Oh, the blending of church and state, what a great idea. And so that happened, but what happened with that was compromise. As trying to appease different belief systems, they allow all kinds of false teachings into what, what was considered appropriate uh, church. Then came the corruption, which I think, I don't remember that, but the sheet I did, um, was a long age. By a tire from 600 to about 1517, so almost a thousand years of corruption through the Dark Ages. Then you come to the Reformation in the Church of Sardis, which was dead, because after the Dark Ages and all the compromise of all those years, the church was dead. Other than there was this remnant, and like Martin Luther and John Wycliffe and some of those guys. And then you come to Philadelphia, the faithful church, what we said was during the 1600s, some a little later, some a little earlier, but you know, 1600s to about 1900, 1906 actually, some say, <coughs> where we had the lukewarm church, which, hmm, that's the last one. I think that's what they're saying, is that's who we are. And I think we are. Not us individually, not us as a church, but I think the church of today is generally lukewarm. It's generally kind of, see, cold is better. <laughs> Lukewarm is yucky. So, as we have throughout this, you know, we go in, in, in step, in order. The first thing was that address to the congregation, which we read. And then in the second part of verse 14 is the introduction of Jesus to the Laodiceans. And so, verse 14, to the angel... For the messenger or the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans write these things as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So this is how Jesus introduces himself to this church. And the first thing he says is he's the Amen. And Amen means so be it. That's what it literally means. And you know, there are so many opinions so many words, so many thoughts, so many ideas that float around. But the last word, the amen, the final word, the final authority is this book. It's Jesus. It's the word. 
That's the only thing that matters. What did God say about the circumstance? What did God say about whatever the discussion is? So, regardless of what anybody thinks, the amen, the last word, that's Jesus. And he's also here, describes himself as the faithful and true witness. As opposed to the Laodiceans, who were neither faithful, nor were they true witnesses. But Jesus declares to us the truth and the faithfulness of Almighty God. And so, just thinking about the witness of who Jesus was, it, it Put me back to John chapter 5. You can all turn back there with me, you can. Because in John chapter 5, in verse 18, Jesus was in deep, deep trouble with the Pharisees and the scribes and all the religious leaders. It says in verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. They want him dead. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So that was the charge. That was the problem. <clears throat> who do you think you are, declaring yourself to be God? You know, there are those who say Jesus never said he was God. Well, certainly the Pharisees didn't think so. These Jews didn't think so. They thought that he was making himself God. And they wanted to kill him. And verse 19 here says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So he says, All I'm doing here is reflecting my Father. I am doing what God the Father has asked me to do. That's what I am doing. That was his testimony to those guys who were trying to kill him. And just jumping down to verse 24, just because I like verse 24, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Sad. Believe. Hear and believe in him who sent me, in God. Believe in him. He passed from death into life. Praise the Lord. So that was what he's sharing with them. That was his witness. And now, how do we know his witness was true? He continued on, and we're just going to jump down to verse 31. He said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. You see, if it's just me saying it, all right, don't listen. Don't pay attention. Scripture says, on the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So he said, look, if I'm the only one witnessing, if I'm the only one saying I came from God, you shouldn't believe me. That was what Jesus declared to them. Verse 32, though, he says, There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You've said to John, John the Baptist, he's speaking of, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things, that you might be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to, for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John. So John is a witness, but then I have a greater one than that. You need another one? Okay, here we go. Verse 36, I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So he's saying, look around and look at all that I have done. I have been out healing the sick, I have raised the dead, I, I you know, feeding 5,000 with a couple of pieces of bread, that's a pretty good job. That's pretty tricky. I've never actually tried that. I'm not thinking I can do that, you know? I think you need to be God to do those kind of things. You know, walk on water, I can do that in the winter. I don't have a very good success right now. I tried it the other day, and it was still cold. <laughs> it's still cold. But the dock is in, so that's a good thing. But, you know, the, the testimony. Not only do I declare myself that I am God, Jesus is saying. John the Baptist said so. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was John's testimony of Jesus. The works that I do testify. In verse 37 um, says, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding 
abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. So the Father has testified through all the prophecy in the Old Testament, through the Word of God in that respect, but also, even though these guys probably did not hear, on the day that Jesus was baptized, what happened? The, the heavens were opened and the dove descends, you know, the Spirit descends in the form of a dove, and the Father said, to you, this is my beloved Son in whom I will please. You know, the, the testimony was there, God the Father speaking, that voice there. He said, so you don't believe me, you don't believe John, you don't believe the works I'm doing, and you don't believe the word that my Father said. And, and that's what he says in verse 39, too. You search the scriptures. I mean, these guys were experts in the law. But you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. It's in the book. It all speaks, it's all about Jesus. It's all about me, he says. But you are not willing to come to me, so you may have life. And so the witness, the testimony, getting back to this statement that he made to the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3, you know, I am the faithful and true witness. That's who he is. And that's who he continues to be. He's faithful. And he's true. And then he calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. That's the other way he identifies himself to that. Now the idea behind the word beginning is the ancient Greek word archi, where we, if you put ology on it, right, archaeology is the study of beginnings, the study of things, but it's also <clears throat> um, the idea behind it is that of a ruler or the source or the origin, not of first in a sequential order. This verse does not teach that Jesus was the first being created, but that he is the ruler, source, and the origin of all creation. So it's not like he's saying, I'm a created being. No, he's eternally God. <clears throat> God is revealed to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's a very great mystery that we can communicate but not understand. That's the best way I can put it. We find ways that we kind of figure it, you know, time, space, matter, you know, those three things that make up our world. It's, there's many different ways we can look at threes that are in this world in which we dwell, but <clears throat> eternally God. In fact, in John chapter 1, go back to John, we'll look at that again. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So that's, we're speaking of Jesus. Well, how do we know that? Because verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only God of the Father, full of grace and so this word that was in the beginning, that was with God and was God, all things were made through him, and nothing was made without him. And so he can declare that, that he's the beginning of the creation of God. That's how he identifies himself <clears throat> to, to the uh, church and the Laodiceans. And so now he turns to talking to them about their condition. Back in Revelation 3, he says in verse 15, I know your works, just like he said to the other six churches. I know what you're doing. I know your works. That you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Don't you love that word, vomit? That's just such a great word. I will spew you. How many words do we have for vomit? Jean should be here, because she hates it when I even say the word. No, there's hurled, there's upchot, there's all that. You know, think of all the things. <coughs> I've got many others, we'll leave it there. But you know, 
It's such a picture, isn't it? That vivid picture, though, of just that forceful rejection. <clears throat> I could wish you were on a cold, but now you look warm. Lukewarmness is a picture of compromise. It's a picture of indifference. A lack of care or concern about the spiritual condition. Something, like I said, I believe is rampant in the church today. And the question that, and I read this, and I thought, this is a great question. This is a good question to ask. So here's the question. Is there any soul harder to reach than the one who has just enough of Jesus to think they have enough? Isn't that a great question? The church of the Laodiceans exemplifies empty religion. They're lukewarm. Lukewarm says, well, I accepted Jesus once. Now leave me alone and let me live my life the way I want to. Or the lukewarm says, well, I go to church when I can. If I have time. If I feel like it. Or a lukewarm individual say, well, I, I, yeah, I read the Bible some once, a little bit. You know, no real care, no real concern. You know, but but I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I do the best I can. You know, all these statements, statements of lukewarmness. You know, in Acts chapter 11, I turned a lot of pages today. For some reason, the Lord led me this way, so it's a good thing. You know? But this is uh, from the early church in Acts 11, verse 19. No persecution had come to Israel, and so the Christians were scattered. And verse 19 says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all, that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. And it's that phrase that I wanted to get to, purpose of heart. That's not a lukewarm statement. Your purpose in your heart that I'm going to serve the God who loved me so much he would die for me. That, there's a purpose. There's a decision. There's a desire. There's an action. There's no room there for lukewarmness. Hot or cold? It's one or the other. Why hot or cold? Well, just think about hot. Hot water. Not, you know, I mean, jump in a hot shower after a, a day outside and it's cold. Some of the days when I was working construction, and it was so cold. Boom, chilling cold. I, I can remember driving home and it was wet, a rainy or snowy day. And driving home, I get the heat on high. My truck, you can't tolerate the heat on high. I got so dehydrated, I was thirsty. It was a half, a half hour to an hour drive home, and just the heat going, and I'm shivering. And nothing is better than jump. It's the shower. Jump in the shower and get that hot water. Oh, finally, get that core temperature heated back up, right? Hot water is nice. Or, or for some of you, I don't understand this, but that morning cup of coffee, you know, that hot... Why do you like coffee? I just don't like coffee. <laughs> I can't do it, but doesn't it soothe and kickstart your day? It's a comfort drink. I understand this. I live with one of you. You know, drinks that stuff. But, you know, or, or on a snowy day, in a nice warm cup of soup, you know, but, but hot. We understand how hot is important, you know, that the hot, or cold, you know, after working on a, on a hot day, and get that cold water, nothing better than a drink of water, but a cold drink, or to dive into the pond, that's a nice thing too, you know, all hot, Ugh. I can remember when, when we were tearing down the, the cabin, the camp that we had to build the house we were in. It was so hot that day. 
And I would just run down, jump in the water, get my shirt, get my clothes all soaked and wet, get back up on the roof with the saws all, start cutting, and you work for a half an hour or so, and then you know, let's go do that again. And how refreshing, you know, and how how helpful, really. Go jump the lake? Absolutely. Sure, glad you thought me now. We'll wait a few more weeks, but so hot or cold, you know, that's what Jesus wants. Something that is useful, something that can bring comfort, something that can help. But look warm. You ever left one of these in the car on a hot summer day? And you come out and you're thirsty and you Right, because it's lukewarm. I don't know what the temperature is. It's, you know, it has to be about 110 or something. But it's just that that tepid, that, that place where it is not refreshing. It is not good. Take a big chuck and chug of it and spew it. You know, and that's what Jesus is saying. You're of no use. You're of no benefit being lukewarm. You need to be hot. You need to be cold. You need to be something that is useful. And I know he works, that you're neither cold nor hot, he says. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This verse 17, his statement of their condition. This is what Jesus said the problem is. I think of this verse a lot. It makes me wonder how, because it speaks of being self-deceived, doesn't it? I think I'm all fine. But wait a minute, no. You know, Jesus is saying, you think that you're rich, you think that you're wealthy, you think that you have need of nothing, and yet you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind and you're naked. And they're not even aware of it. They don't even know it. They think, hey, we're doing great. What is there in my life that I'm self-deceived about? Well, that's a real good question to ponder. This verse always challenges me that way. Because what these people in Laodicea thought of themselves in no way matched reality. You see, they were putting their trust in their material prosperity, in outward luxury, and in their physical health, and they felt like they didn't need anything. They were the exact opposite of those that Jesus spoke to in the Sermon on the Mount, when he commended them and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Yeah, no, I'm not poor in spirit. I'm doing great. Spiritually rich, doing well. No, you're wretched, you're miserable. You're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. There was a study that came out last week. I don't know if you heard it. It came out on May 6th. Was that last week? I think so. What's today? May 16th. Okay, a little over a week. I can't even remember dates. They just they're gone. It says this. For almost half of all Americans, modesty may not be their best quality. A new study finds nearly one in two people believe they're the best person they know. Isn't that interesting? Do you hear that study? In a recent survey of 2,000 United States residents, 81% say they believe that humankind is inherently good. What does Jesus say? There is none good, no, not one. Sometimes it's not, uh, you know, kind of like this church, isn't it? Oh, I think we're all fine. Well, wait a minute. No, you're wretched. You're miserable, you're poor, blind, naked. So 81% say they believe humankind is inherently good. Three in four believe they themselves are fundamentally a good person. And when researchers ask respondents how they would compare themselves to others in their lives, 46% went a step further, admitting in their eyes they're better than everyone else they know. I'm just the most awesome person. <laughs> Boy, you're lucky to know me. You know, can you imagine? Ha! Huh. Sounds great. But that's half of Americans. Look at it that way. Now, the survey was conducted by one poll and commissioned by Behold Retreats. I'm just telling you where it came from. Not that I support them, because I absolutely do not. Because it's a wellness company that specializes in the therapeutic use of plant-based medicines to aid in personal and spiritual growth. 
Oh, sure it does. Now, what aids in personal and spiritual growth is this book. Amen. Not that garbage. No. However, looking at responses by gender, female respondents were less likely to think of themselves as good. Figures. Nothing big on us guys. Uh, 67% of women and 86% of men think of themselves as good, though. So stats are still pretty high. And more likely to believe that humanity is inherently bad. Women are more likely, 20% of women think that um, humanity is inherently bad. 4% of men. Boy, we think the best of everybody. Our us men great, you know? <laughs> but deceived. Can't imagine. See, because I'm comparing me with Jesus. I'm not comparing me with other people. And when I compare me with Jesus, I got a lot of work to do. I got a long ways to go. I'm nowhere near the best person I know. Nowhere near it. He is. But looking forward, respondents remained optimistic about the future. Two and three Americans are confident that their life is going in the right direction. <clears throat> On a global scale, 61% are similarly confident that humanity is progressing in the same way. I don't know what in the world they're looking at. This world is going crazy. Going to hell in the handbasket. Isn't that the phrase? You know? That's the way it seems to me. I don't know what they're looking at. I have so many things I could say there, but anyway, it sounds a lot like American and the Laodicean church is similar. They think, oh, we're rich. We've become wealthy and made of nothing. And do not know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. How needy we are. Because our need is the right relationship with God. That's what the need is. That's where the, you know, that's where true riches are. That's what he goes on to say. This is what you need to do, he says, to those in Laodicea and to the church of today, because this is really a per picture of the church today, the world today. Now, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. And so that's what he says. This is what you need to do. But how do we buy things from Jesus? He said, "I counsel you to buy from me these things: the gold, the white garments, and the eye saw." Well, how do we do that? He wants us to purchase these things. So where do we get them? How do we obtain them? What currency do we use? What kind of money do I have that can buy these things from the Lord? And it, you know, in reading this, it seemed to me in Isaiah 55, he was speaking of the same thing. So there we go, we'll turn the pages again. In Isaiah chapter 55, He says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. How can you buy without any money, right? That's what we're talking about. What's the currency? Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. But you got to buy it. How do I buy it? So why do you spend money? Verse 2, on what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So, you know, verse 2, it's listen. What do we buy with? Listen. we got to listen. First thing, incline your ear. Hear. You know, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. First thing we got to do is listen. we got to hear. And then verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. We've got to seek him. We've got to call upon him, it says. Also in verse 6. And then in verse 7, so let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So these are all things that we need to do. But ultimately, it's all encapsulated in halfway through verse 7 here in Isaiah 55 where it says, let him return to the Lord. You see, we've got treasure, but we can't buy it with our treasure, with our wealth, with our money. We may have talent, talents, abilities, giftings, that way. It isn't with that either. But it's time. That's the other thing we have. That's how we buy that, by spending time with the Lord. That's how we can buy these things from the Lord, by giving Him our time, giving Him our attention, being aware that He is with us, always. That's such a bad thing. You know, in every, every place He leads us, everywhere He takes us, all the things we're involved in, to be aware that He is with us. So the goal here, back in Revelation chapter 3, it speaks of true riches found only in the redemption through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, by which we have been adopted into the family of God. It speaks of his redemption, the gold. And of course, the white garments, they speak of the apparel of heaven. Everybody in heaven is clothed in white, so it's a picture of the purity, of, of lack of sin. And then the eye sob speaks of having spiritual vision. To see, to be aware, to know. Second Kings, maybe we'll read that one too. Let me get back here. Second Kings chapter 6. Speaking of seeing, I love this story. So I love it. Verse 8. In Second Kings chapter 6. Um, it says, now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with the servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God said to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you not, do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? All right, there's somebody here that's a spy running over to Israel, letting the king know whenever we're going out to war, where we're going to be. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, And one of his servants said, None, my lord. We're, the, we're not for the king of Israel. None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he did, and the story goes on to tell how he led them right into uh, Samaria, they could have been captured, they could have been killed. Instead, they had a feast, and they went away, and they became buddies. You know, what a great story that is. But the thing here, Lord, 
pray. <laughs> I pray, you know, Elisha said, pray that uh, you would open the eyes that he may see, that you might be aware, that you might see that those that are for us, it's always, always, as Christians, always, there are so many more for us than are against us. And we're not aware of that. We don't focus on that so much. But one great story, isn't it? Don't you love that story? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so much more we can read. There we will one of these days. We'll get there. But <clears throat> you know, we may not see with our eyes what is taking place in the spirit world around us. We may not see it with our eyes, but we can see by faith that God is in control. And we can have confidence in so in verse 19, though, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. How does he do that? How does God do that? And I maintain that he doesn't do it by condemning. That's not the, the M.O. of our Lord. You know, John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn this world, but that the world through him might be saved. I think God's chastening, God's rebuke is through conviction. He reveals to us our guilt before Him. He draws us towards repentance and back to a right relationship with Him through seeking and receiving forgiveness. He leads us in the paths of repentance. He's not mad at us. He's not, he loves us, you know. As many as I love. You know, I rebuke like we did, our kids. We never get mad at our kids and we're like, all right, I'm going to, well, maybe a few of you, but I'm going to sell you to some <laughs> slave traders or somebody, you know. <clears throat> but, you know, that's, that's not, that's not it. We love our kids. And we chase them. We correct them. We guide them. Why? Because we don't want them to reflect badly on us. No, because we want them to do right. We want them to be accepted in general Society, you know, when they go places and do things, that they would be um, behave right, behave rightly, and that's the way it is with the Lord. You know, you look at verse nineteen. You know, he says, "Therefore, be zealous and repent." That's all. Be zealous and repent. You know, that's what he says to this lukewarm, self-deceived church. And repent means change your course. Turn around, go another way. And zealous is from the same Greek word as the word hot is. You know? So be, be on fire for the Lord. And I like it, you know, even though, and we've seen this with the other churches, even though there's, Jesus has these problems with them and things that they're doing that are not right, he always has an answer. But look, there's a way out of the difficulty. A way out of the problem. And then you come to verse 20. You know, his heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. I'm, the, I'm here. I'm present. I'm always present. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. And he with me. The willingness of the Lord expressed in that. I want to have fellowship with you. I love you. I want to be with you. But you know, if he knocks, we have to open the door. He's not going to go, he's not going to get one of those battery rams and boom, break down the door of your heart and come storming in. That's not it. He doesn't do that. He's a gentleman. He'll never intrude beyond our will. We have to open the door. And the key to opening the door, if anyone hears my voice, you know, you to hear him speaking, drawing, calling to you. Anyone, anyone, it's open to anyone. Not just you and you and you if you open the door. No, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And if you do that, and as you've done that, as you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he says to him, verse 21, who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. We get to go sit in the big seat. <laughs> my dad, he had his own, he had his seat. I don't know if you have that in your house, but my dad, this was his seat. 
When dad wasn't there, we, us kids, we used to fight over who got to sit in dad's seat. You know, that's just the way it is. We're going to sit in dad's seat. However, when dad came home, it was a, just a brush of the hand. You'd get right up. You knew. Nope, that's his seat. He's going to sit there. But you know, Jesus is saying, I'm going to grant to sit with me on my throne. You get to sit in my seat. And that reminded me as well of Luke 14, though. You know, here's the deal. You know, if for those who were lukewarm, for those who were so far away from the Lord, and they repent, you know, the humility that comes with that, right? Where are you going to sit? And it, it's, it's this parable that Jesus told in Luke 14, verse 7. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, we're going to a wedding feast. We've been invited to a wedding feast of the Lamb. Do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin to, with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, or higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But the picture I get out of that is Jesus, someday. At this wedding feast, perhaps, I don't know, but he's going to say, friend, no, come up higher. You know, he's going to point out the one here, you know, that that's a picture I get when he said, to him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He's going to call us. And isn't he doing that? Call us to a higher place. Call us to the seat of honor and to bless and so we come to the last verse of chapter 3. It's the typical, the general exhortation that Jesus has given to each church. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you want to identify themselves with the church of Laodicea, we would much rather identify ourselves with the church of Philadelphia, the faithful church, but may God deliver us from the self-reliant, compromising lukewarmness that marked the church of the Laodiceans. And may he do that for us. Because it's really, it's an easy thing to slip into lukewarmness. What do you have to do to get something lukewarm? Right? You have to take it out of the flow and kind of set it there and leave it. Right? You're not doing much. You're sitting there. And you cool off. You know, like taking a coal out of a fire. It doesn't take long. It doesn't cool right off. Get into the fire. Or for water, you know, got to be in ice or, or in the stream itself or in the pond and with everybody else, you know. Well, prophetically, the church of Laodicea is the last of the seven churches and a picture of the church in the last days before Jesus returns. I believe this church is indicative of the days in which we live. Much of what is called the church today is lukewarm at best, and many have lost the message of the gospel and instead are focused on social justice and societal concerns, all worried about, you know, which isn't a bad thing. See, what did Jesus say to us individually, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, talking about food and clothing and all these things that society needs. All these things will be added to you. Well, I maintain it's as true of a church as it is of an individual. The church first, the main priority is to seek Jesus, seek after him. But so many churches today are not doing that. They get so busy, like the church in Ephesus, you know, doing all the good works and such. They have plenty of good works, yet they have left their first love. The lukewarmness, where does it come from? Just, oh, we're okay, we're fine, you know, just... Complacency, not realizing that there's a, a war going on, a spiritual war. There's truth and there's deception, and there's a lot of it. And we live in an age where the church seems more about wealth than worldliness, than about righteousness and holiness. Many churches 
are concerned with programs to promote growth and their numbers of attendees or whatever. And then when they get them, they preach milky sermons because they're afraid to offend anyone. They're afraid to say things like sin is sin, right? Homosexuality is a sin. Oh no, we can't say that. Somebody might be offended. This transgenderism that's going on is insanity. And it's so such an abomination to the Lord. But to say that, oh, so many churches, oh, you can't say that. I'm just going to tell you what God says. That's it, right? That's who we are. This is what God says. In my opinion, my opinion doesn't matter to anything. But God's opinion does. And the church has gotten away from it. So many, in so many places. So we need to pray for the churches. Churches of America, churches everywhere. Pray for a holy fire to be kindled among believers. Pray for conviction to fall on all who are asleep because it is time to wake up. Because I, I believe Jesus is coming soon. We're going to talk about the rapture next week. I know there's different ideas on the rapture, when it occurs and all that, but I'm going to give you my perspective. You know, and it's a great topic for discussion always. But the reality is, Jesus did say he would return. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return. You know, he's coming back one of these days. <clears throat> but for us as a church, and for each one of us individually, let us resolve to stay close to the Lord. That's our goal. Close to the Lord to be the salt and light he desires us to be until we're called for eternity. Amen. Boy, that's what I'm all to do. I have a lot to say today, though. It just happens that way sometimes. I don't wait all. Well, let's, uh, let's stand and pray. <clears throat> Close with any hymn. And there's so much more I could have said, but sometimes, you know, you just have things you've got to say. And thank you for your patience. Let's pray. Lord, we do desire to be on fire for you. Pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would empower and embolden us to be salt and light, to be your witnesses in this dark and scary world in which we live. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters being here today. And just pray, Lord, that as we go, you would go before them and go with them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hymn number 336, Jesus Uncommon.